FinTech Talk, the live webinar with no presentations, no PowerPoint, just talk. Hello and welcome to FinTech Talk. I'm your host, Charles Orton Jones. Today's subject is international payments and it's a cracker. Our premise is that cross-border payments are a mess. There are 70 fast payment systems around the world and they connect across borders every which way possible. Very few people other than specialists understand all these connections. And the truth is consumers and companies are being let down by expensive, slow and complicated payment processes. So to figure out where the industry should go, we thought we'd invite three global experts to talk us through it. Which payments are obsolete? Which payments are the future? One from a bank, one from a fintech, and I'm glad to say one from Visa. So we have all angles covered. And I hope by the end of this 40 minute segment, you're gonna understand international payments. So let me introduce the panel. I'm gonna start with uh, Samia Moen from Visa. Samia is Senior Director of Product Management at Visa B2B Connect and is an expert on I think, both legacy systems and how fintech payment methods work. Samia, is that about right to sum you up? Uh, that's, that's a good summary, Charles. Great to be here. Fantastic. I'm so pleased you're able to join us. And from the traditional banking world, we have Shubham Jain who is Principal Product Lead, FX and Cross-Border Payments at BNY Mellon. Now, BNY Mellon counts as a traditional bank, but it's invested huge amounts in upgrading its systems. So is an exemplar on what traditional banks can do to compete and work with fintechs. So Shubham, pleased to have you with us. Pleased to join you as well and happy to uh, join the panel. So good. and. From the world of fintech, I'm delighted to welcome Ram Sundaram, who is co-founder and chief operating officer of TerraPay. Now, TerraPay is one of the world's largest and most active fintech payment enablers. It works in 29 countries and has partnerships with everybody. Ram, delighted to have you with us. If you turn your camera and mic on, Ram. We will allow Ram to press his buttons. He will join us in a second. But for um, yeah, our panel, I wanted to point to what I thought was a really hard-hitting article, and it really surprised me the ECB published this, by Fabio Panetta, who is governor of the Bank of Italy. And Fabio just points out what a colossal mess cross-border payments are right now. They are expensive. We're looking at 1.5% fees for companies, 6.3% for consumers, migrant workers really getting it in the neck. It's a hindrance on growth because sending money back is expensive. SMEs are reluctant to cross borders. And for banks and fintechs, there's such a proliferation of systems and standards that the industry does not know where to go. Samia, what is your reaction? I mean, am I exaggerating? You know, mess, pain points. How do you see it? This is absolutely accurate. Um, I spent the last 10 years of my career prior to getting into payments in co the corporate treasury world. And so I was personally responsible for setting up and funding our legal entities around the globe uh, at Visa and prior to that at Tesla. And uh, I have a lot of experience trying to send money to uh, remote corners of the globe and getting frustrated, having it take a really long time, um, having the costs be opaque uh, and being surprised by the costs and having a lot of frictions with, with that whole process. Gosh. And um, just tell me about the complexity of it all. I mean, I sometimes feel as though I'm, I don't know, missing a trick as I, I find it overwhelming trying to study international payments. How does it feel for a specialist? I mean, is this a subject that only a devoted expert can get to grips with now? Because there are so many complicated systems worldwide. It really is complicated. And, and the reason is that the legacy systems form a web of bilateral relationships. And so the SWIFT messaging framework is used by all the banks, so that's great. But the actual cash transfer happens through the correspondent banking system. And uh, 
this is higher cost for, for three reasons, right? Uh, one is the need to exchange one currency for another. The second is banks have liquidity management costs associated with maintaining balances in these accounts in multiple currencies. And then there's um, compliance requirements. There's various country specific documentation requirements. And so all these put together make the process unnecessarily complicated. I'm relieved to hear you say this. So if anyone's watching this thinking they're a little overwhelmed by the complexity of the subject, you are not alone. Perhaps I could turn to uh, Shubham. I mean, from the perspective of a bank like BNY Mellon, huge organization, complicated organization, you've got legacy systems trying to modernize. Perhaps you could just sum up your job and what it's like trying to deal with so many different payment systems. <laughs> And Charles, I think so. May I echo quite a few good points, right? I mean, this is such an exciting space. There's so much happening, but the more there's, you know, there's happening, it's mm. just so hard to keep in pace with everything that's going on. Look, at BNY Mellon, you know, I'm closely involved in revolutionizing how we do or think about cross-border payments. And I've had several, uh, roles in the past with banks like JP Morgan, where uh, you know, focused mainly on revolutionizing domestic payments. Mm. I think words like speed, costs, certainty, transparency are just a given now in payments. I put myself as a consumer, putting banks aside, and you know, when I'm sending payments overseas, I still see, I, I don't have a view of how long it's going to take for my payments to reach from, let's say, from the UK to India. I don't have a view mm. of costs. Recently, as last week, I see random deductions on my payments. These are common friction points, which we're seeing in cross-border payments. And again, when you look at domestic payments, they're just they're becoming smoother, they're becoming more frictionless, they're becoming more instantaneous. Mm -hmm. So I think the golden question is, why can't that same experience be provided to international transactions? <laughs> Such a good introduction. Fantastic, I couldn't agree more. And uh, you know, Ram, perhaps you could just tell us from the perspective of FinTech, you know, how badly punished are people like migrant workers by these expensive, slow legacy systems? Oh, extremely so. Uh, when we started off in uh, 2015, we did, as soon as we got a system set up in a very in rudimentary mode, just we wanted to do a proof of concept. So we sent a transaction from uh, MTO in, uh, in Dubai to Airtel Money in Rwanda, right? It reached in, in a few seconds, mm -hmm. Everything, everybody was very happy. You could demonstrate the, the transfer happening. All, all good, right? And then my co-founder and I went out around Dubai to try to find out how much a transfer like that would cost. And there was only one extremely large uh, MTO that could provide services to Rwanda at that time. And a transaction would have cost 25% of uh, the transaction value, right? Uh, that was the only option. There was no other option. Now, you know, what Samya and Shubham have been talking and their experiences uh, have been, the, the examples they raise have been to corridors that are actually better served. Uh, when you come to countries like Rwanda, when you come to countries that are at the, at the tail end of bu uh, building out infrastructure, right, that's when it re really gets challenging. And that's where we see costs being really high. And uh, in the time that we've been doing this in the last nine years, we've seen co costs drop substantially in the corridors that we serve. Uh, we'd like to take a little bit of credit for that, but obviously digitalization is, is what's pushing it. Last mile infrastructure was, is what's pushing it. That's all. Fantastic. Uh, Shubham, perhaps you could just talk us through the transition. I mean, talk us through the difference between some of the legacy payment systems that you're trying to get rid of and some of the more modern systems. And really for you, just spell out what is the future? I mean, is it standardization so that no matter what the variation is in payment systems, everyone's kind of working in a similar way? How, how, you know, what are you trying to get rid of and where, where are we heading? Yeah, well, you have to really look at around the envelope and see what's happening around the world, you know, to start with. SEPA is a great example where we're seeing, you know, a good example of convergence, how you can harmonize payment, you know, processing across a region. We're seeing similar developments, you know, in the Nordics with P27 or in APAC where, you know, select markets have come closely to, you know, you know, offer seamless QR code payments across the region. And that's, you know, again, it's happening in clusters. But when you look at cross-border payments, what the biggest challenge for us is standardization. 
And when we kind of build across the systems, it's standardization in terms of communication across different uh, platforms. It's interoperability. You know, banks like ourselves and many others have been grappling with the ISO transition, which again will help cross-border payments in the long run, but how do we kind of grapple with this change right now? And that's what we're trying to move over you know, quickly uh, and at the same time, make sure we have mm. harmonized set of APIs which can communicate or help bridge the gap between cross-border payment infrastructures. I want to ask you about the ISO um, uh, 200022. And I know that, you know, talking about ISO standardization is a technical and difficult subject, but it's, it's so central to what's going on here. Perhaps you could tell us your view. Is this a, an interesting and worthwhile development? No, it, it is. And it, it's one of those things which seems like a surgery for you know a massive change that we're having to make mm. it's not just the banks like ourselves that are have that are having to offer new services but it's ultimately the customers who are using the service who need the flexibility as well so in the short term our focus is to be more flexible have translation services to bridge the gap between you know start to end which is fully iso uh, you know having more well defined data mm. dictionaries and then eventually where this will lead to is greater adoption of APIs. APIs that can help streamline communication, okay. that can help removing frictional processes to reduce manual steps in cross-border payments. Um, I, I think it's a great move, uh, mm -hmm. but there is a bit of, there is a way, there's still a bit of time to get there. A lot of work, a lot of new things being built. Now, Samia, perhaps you could take us into the heart of, uh, you know, Visa, v, Visa B2B Connect. So what are you building in Visa B2B? Sure, I know we talked about uh, the consumer payments just now, particularly the migrant workers that are being hit hard on the remittances front. Um, I lead network strategy for Visa's cross-border payments product called B2B Connect, which is a business-to-business -business payments product. So it's a same-day business payments network under the larger Visa umbrella. It's uh, one of the few non-card-based products and it's an alternative to the traditional swift messaging and the correspondent banking network uh, so our member banks can route their high value payments through b2b connect uh, to other corporates around the globe okay now if you'd like to put the boot into swift i mean it's a venerable old messaging system just tell us your view of swift what are its defects and why does it need a replacement well, first of all, to touch upon, you know, something that Shubhan mentioned with uh, the ISO 20 or 22 messaging with SWIFT, that's a great step forward. Uh, it's one of the key drivers in moving to that is it gives participants richer and more structured data than the industry currently has. And that's one of the flaws in the current system. Um, so we'll have rich and structured data, and this will help us do better checks up front uh, and then you know, lower frictions and better reconciliation after the fact as well. Um, but, but uh, you know, I wouldn't say that we are positioning ourselves as an alternative to SWIFT. Uh, it's important to understand SWIFT is just a messaging framework. It's the dominant messaging right. framework. And um, Visa is working closely with SWIFT and has announced a few uh, collaborative uh, projects at the recent Cybos conference as well. So we're looking to improve the speed of payment transmission, ideally same day, of course, depends on geography. Um, if you're sending from US to Asia, it's not going to be same day, it's going to be next day. Um, but we're really That's an alternative to the traditional correspondent banking network. And you think same day is okay? I mean, people talk about, you know, real time, whatever that exactly means. You think same day is okay for companies? I think we're going to get to real time, and I think that's the goal. Uh, that's where all of all of us want to get to for you know both for consumer payments and for business payments. But even same day will be a huge improvement on what we have currently. And uh, I know many mm. of us have personal experience with that. Ram mentioned Rwanda, uh, and uh, you know I've also had experiences funding our Rwandan entity from our European entity and having that take weeks and have additional documentation requirements and so on. And one really dramatic example was in Venezuela, the government decided to revalue their currency in August 2021, where a million bolivar got devalued into one bolivar. So imagine imagine sending payments to a country which has, uh, you know, so much of turmoil. 
So it's, it's not easy, but we'll start with same day, we'll get to real time. <laughs> Dealing with Venezuela, yes, difficult in every way imaginable. Um, Ram, I'm really interested just in TerraPay because you've been able to look you know, afresh with a blank sheet of paper at payments. Perhaps you can just tell everyone here, maybe you aren't that familiar with what TerraPay does, what it is that you do and why it's different to some of the legacy systems. Yeah, so when we started off in 2015, uh, we had a very simple um, mission there, which was that we wanted to interconnect. We wanted to be the SWIFT for mobile wallet platforms. Now, mobile wallet platforms, in case you, some of you may not be familiar with them, in Africa and in Asia and in Latin, they are very different from mobile wallets in Europe and in the US. In Europe and the US, they are front ends to a bank account, right? They are apps that are backed by either a card or a bank account. In Africa, in Asia, they are actually stored value instruments. They are the equivalent of bank accounts without having, without being issued by a bank, without having a bank number, account number on it, it's identified by a mobile number. Now, these wallet platforms were silos. Even today, a lot of them are silos. They're closed user systems, right? So you can transact with people on the same platform merchants on the same platform, but you can't really transact in between them. So we wanted to interconnect them. And that's where we started off with, and we started working with banks for settlement. And then the banks that we were working with for settlement also wanted to connect to the wallets. So we started connecting bank accounts as well. And it evolved into essentially a digital infrastructure. So today we connect uh, banks, mobile wallets and cards in 124 countries. And uh, it, that's about seven and a half billion bank accounts, four and a half billion wallets, six billion cards. And to most of these, we can send transactions in real time. And to wallets, it's always in real time. It's under 10 seconds. Bank accounts, it's about 15 minutes. Yeah, that's, that's uh, interesting. Ram, who, who, who do you see as your rivals? I mean, who are you replacing? So we are infrastructure, we are interoperable infrastructure. So we don't really have rivals in the sense because any company that you think we compete with, we also work with in some geography or the other where they have a better network, right? We don't, it's, so it's, it's interoperable infrastructure. You connect to everybody, you work with everybody. Mm -hmm. You send transactions through Visa, you send tra transactions through Visa Direct. We send transactions through Visa Direct. Visa Direct sends transactions through us, right? So we all work with each other. It's it's uh, we have to work with each other to build out this network globally, right? To to reach everybody, we can't do it all on our own. That's we, a good theme. I mean, the smart um, answer to that. Sorry, sorry, the smart answer to that is we compete with cash. <laughs> That's what we seek to replace. <laughs> makes yeah, it makes perfect sense. Yeah, I'm sure. sure yeah, um, this idea that it's all about you know, partnerships and cooperation as opposed to you know, the more dramatic storyline of, of A versus B. I wonder at um, you know, BNY Mellon, um, Shubham, how do you see it? Is it about building partnerships with fintechs or is it a rivalry? No, it's, it's a great question and it's something that has been often asked in the industry. Like, I think it's, it's about partnerships eventually. I mean, as Ram said, we need to build the ecosystem together. And what's happening in cross-border payments is they are, you know, you, the segment of low value cross-border traffic, which has kind of been ignored in the past, is now coming to light more. You've seen some developments around Swift Go. You've seen pilots like mm -hmm. IXB, et cetera, pick off in the region. This is the market. This is where the future of cross-border payments is. And, you know, to enable this again, what our customers want is multiple methods, flexible methods to pay, to pay out into. We want to connect into accounts, wallets, cash points, they want this flexibility of option. And that's where to provide this flexibility, we need that interoperability. So it is a partnership, but again, in that partnership, it's important to understand what value does a bank bring versus what value does a FinTech bring. Uh, mm -hmm. The tried and tested customer, trusted customer base for a bank, along with kind of the understanding of regulations and the regulatory framework, is just so critical for us uh, to provide that trust safe and secure product to our customers and then likewise we're, you know we're, where we have the fintechs you know just taking thinking big but building in small steps towards that that's just something that we're you know traditional players like mm. ourselves continue to evolve with tell us about the timeline because in a way i just thought, ooh, 
what you're saying, but um, it feels like the industry has been talking this way for quite some time. It, here we have the government of the Bank of Italy saying, no, things are still complex, expensive, slow. Um, Shabon, why does it take a bank, you know, an organization like BNY Mellon, which is, let's say, an exemplar, you know, a considerable amount of time to develop these things? I mean, what, are, what is the most difficult thing about modernizing payments? It's not just about hey, here's the technical bill or the solution and we just plug and play. And often this is, you know, we connecting to just a single API to offer, you know, world of cross-border payment solutions. But it's also what goes into that. It's understanding regulatory considerations across different markets. Understanding, you know, are you mm. covered? Are your customers, your clients covered from, you know, you know, possible fraud? Or, you know, are you, you know, complying with the necessary regulations along the way? So building is not just technical, it's also kind of handshaking between our risk compliance and legal partners, vetting you know every new solution through them. I think that sometimes, given how stringent the regulatory framework for banks is, it just sometimes takes a bit more time. Equally on the tech side, we see you know you know more sophisticated solutions at times with fintechs, but again, it's that understanding and communication. Why are banks grappling with these challenges? Uh, and if I think both parties can come to that understanding quicker and have more communication, that can be a great way to improve the partnership. Now, talking of regulation or the unregulated Wild West, uh, Ram, I have a question for you, and I cannot resist asking it. In this field, there are certain believers in crypto solutions, Bitcoin, Lightning, Network, um, there are umpteen sort of layer two solutions that get suggested. I'd just like to ask you, um, Ram, from someone who has an open mind about new technology, is there any future for these kind of crypto payment methods shaking up cross-border payments? What do you think? Well, there probably is, but I haven't seen it yet. There is nothing that can be done today by crypto or blockchain that can't be done by existing tech faster, better, safer, cheaper at scale. So I, I do think- you regard, Do you regard that as a consensus in the industry? Do you, do you ever meet any industry who disagrees with you? Because, you know, I'm a skeptic. I'd love to be convinced right. otherwise, but clearly there are people who, you know, I was talking to a university professor who was adamant that the Bitcoin Lightning Network had virtues that couldn't be replicated easily. But um, I, do, I, I mean, I I, can you see. sound like you're pretty emphatic, Ram. I can see where that comes from because you know I, I I can well the technology hat as well as the as the practical financial services hat right, and if you're looking at it purely from a technology perspective, mm. yes, it is it is uh, it's fascinating. What does it actually solve? If you look at what does the whole blockchain cryptocurrency ecosystem solve, you know we talk about networks, we talk about messaging, we talk about correspondent banks. A payment is a message. It's just a message. It's like sending an email or sending a text message, right? But it's backed by a trust relationship. And that trust relationship on the SWIFT network is a correspondent banking relationship, right? So you have layers, you have a chain of trust that moves the money through. You have to, in the, in the traditional world, you have bilateral relationships to establish that trust. What crypto tries to do, or the whole ecosystem tries to do is to remove that trust, to, to create payments without creating trust, without having a trusted relationship, right? Mm. Uh, which effectively is for anonymous payments. If you look at where that came from, that came from a very libertarian point of view where you, know, you, you, you need to be able to make payments that are anonymous, you need your privacy. Yes, all good things, but they don't work very well in, in our regulated financial ecosystem. So we're trying to marry something that is really lovely technology but it doesn't really have a very practical use case at the moment. Mm. Might there be, you talk about trust, I mean, we mentioned Venezuela earlier, but it may have an application in countries where trust is completely broken down, where the Venezuelan government um, acts as bad as reprehensibly as it can towards its citizens, um, hyperinflation. Uh, there are other cases such as governments you know, essentially putting their hand in the treasury. Um, there's a pretty remote use cases ram but do you think therefore there still could be a, a purpose for crypto in countries where law and order is broken down it's um access to crypto is not easy right it's uh if if you think that crypto can replace cash in those countries it can't really do that right you can't you can't uh, 
have the kind of penetration that cash does. Uh, it's crypto is hard to understand. Mm -hmm. Are you comfortable using a crypto wallet? Are you comfortable that uh, uh, your your money is safe in crypto? You're not. You're putting your eggs in a lot of untrusted <laughs> baskets, <laughs> and uh, yes. I don't I don't <laughs> think that ecosystem is ready for it yet. It's it needs. Uh, if you look at the financial ecosystem today, it there are a lot of players. And their roles and responsibilities have been defined over time. There is regulation that governs them. There is a whole basis for that trust relationship mm -hmm. that we have today. And that doesn't exist in, in the crypto ecosystem. It's not so easy to replace that. The only people who can really use it today are people who don't need to, uh, who don't want to uh, have their payments tracked. Yes. I think your timing is good because there's, I don't know, it was another um, $30 million heist associated with LastPass the single password manager that had a breach and customers had their passwords leaked. Um, total disaster for their brand. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's not an unusual situation where all of a sudden yet another crypto vulnerability has been found and money drained. So that's, okay, that's, it's nice to nail that because it does pop up. But I like this idea of you know, what doesn't work as much as what does. Um, Samia, I know it's a bit of a hand grenade question, but what technologies do you think are being phased out or what proved to be a dead end? Um, so so to go back, you know, to the pain points and that, that the technology is part hmm. of it, uh, right? Um, the legacy platforms that we currently have in the system vary by country as well. So that's, that's part of it. We don't have a, a single unified platform. Most of these platforms were built when paper-based processes existed and and then it was migrated to electronic systems in a kind of patchwork way and so they have some limitations in terms of volumes they can process uh, the the lack of real-time status of where the payment is um, and then the data processing speed is slow as well and so this is what creates delays in settlement uh, the second part of that is also just the sanction screening in financial crimes. And this ties into, you know, what, what Ron was talking about, what we were talking about earlier with crypto, right? Crypto is not a risk-free uh, and dependable asset the way cash mm -hmm. is. And cash has some legitimacy that is conferred to it by the central bank. And so in that sense, central bank uh, digital currency may have some of that legitimacy and that might be the path forward. Mm -hmm. Uh, but but otherwise, you know, the lack of legitimacy means that we need to have special sanction screening tools um, and different countries have different regulations with respect to sanction screening. So if you have a cross border payment, there might be several spots uh, in the payment where it needs to be screened and rescreened for that particular country. So so all of these, it's not one technology per se, but it's the you know, proliferation of, of all of these technologies that don't speak well with each other. Thank you so much. That's a very complete answer. And if our viewers have any questions for our panel, please just type them into the box, hit enter, and I would love to pass those questions on. So let's talk about what the future is, um, whether we're on the right path or not. Um, Shubham, tell us, for people watching this who want to become more familiar or more confident that they know where the payment industry is going in the cross-border sense, what should they be researching? Well, it's, it, it sounds as if you're hinting that it's all about standardization, better regulation, and, and building partnerships. Actually, you just tell us you know, what you think the winning formula is going to be. Well, the, the short answer is there is no winning formula. There are a bunch of winning formulas. And you know, often we get asked the question, is it, you know, should we be should there be more partnerships or should we be building direct or should we be should should correspondent banking continue there is no one answer it's, it's a combination of all and to me the more flexible and the more adaptive you are in this industry the more success you will see so having not just standardization but a unified payments ecosystem across and and bridging the gap with you know items like apis how and Translating that into a common, custom, you know, a user-friendly experience. That's something that, you know, would win the game. Again, at the end of the day, customers want cheaper, secure, and more certain cross-border payments. A lot of that is what they see on the front end and what, what you know, the information they're fed back. And if 
we collectively can bring that view to the customer, uh, that's that's a win-win. Interesting. And uh, Ram, I'd like to ask you, you know, what does success look like? There's so much work being done in this field, yet we still have the governor of the Bank of Italy saying, no, things are not good enough, too slow, too expensive, too fragmented. From your perspective, when will you be able to say, yep, OK, we're, we're over the, the hump of the hill. Things are now looking pretty rosy in international payments. Um, what metrics are we going to use to know when we've hit a sort of golden era? Personally, I've had the same metric for the last nine years that we've been doing therapy. And uh, it is that if I can send, if my customers can send a $10 payment cross-border that arrives in real time within, within seconds and at a cost that they don't have to think about, we would have done something that we set out to do. Right? We are not there yet, but that, that is really what we are looking at, which means that every part of this ecosystem, this interoperable ecosystem, is working at its most efficient best that's a pretty good metric yep i've hard to dissent from that and okay we've got about 10 minutes to go i'd just like to ask about some of the kind of international schemes and your views on them because we've got things like you know g20 roadmap we've got um the sort of target instant payment settlement stuff uh, ram while you're on the mic um which schemes have you know, seized you and made you think yeah these are ambitious these are impressive. There's target instant payment settlement, um, the G20 roadmap. Which have you looked to and thought, yep, that they've got real substance to them? So we work with all of them, right? We, we, we work with the UNCDF, we work with the BIS, we work with, uh, on all these, we, we try to do pilots where uh, we see what works best. One of the things that uh, Mr. Panetta referred in that article is, is, the, is making real-time payments in different uh, countries interoperable. Right, connecting them directly. We are doing some work on that. It's, some, it's really exciting. We are we partnered with NPCI in India to make NPCI's UPI interoperable. They are doing bilaterals with some countries directly, but there are other countries where we are taking that. Uh, we are directly connecting to SEPA as, as a fintech can, which is called indirect in SEPA parlance. But uh, so that we we will be getting directly into ACHs wherever we can. I think that is a model. I, I did comment on that article on on, uh, on LinkedIn where I was talking about it, how it's important to create an open framework for this kind of interoperability where you don't create unintentional monopolies of settlement or uh, lock-ins, which, which actually make these problems worse in future. You, the, when you're designing these kind of interoperable systems, it's, it, it's important to keep an open standards and open competition viewpoint in mind so that you they scale up well, right? And you don't build dependencies. So I think that's the kind of area we work in, um, we focus on and we're working with all these institutions to try to get to that point. Thank you. Um, Samia, really same question to you. So the, uh, there's a lot of interesting work that's being done right now, and some of it is cited in the article as well, uh, attempts to interlink between different uh, fast payment systems or real-time payment systems around the world. I think Europe is leading the charge there uh, within the Euro area. The BIS Nexus project is another really interesting one. Uh, the Bank of International Settlements Innovation Hub um, it had uh, done a pilot project where they connected uh, the real-time payment systems between the Euro system, Malaysia, and Singapore together. So I believe that pilot was launched uh, earlier this year in 2023. And so this is uh, a test and might lead to a larger set of interlinkages between these faster payment system. And that's an interesting one because it's... Uh, you know, it's it's the BIS, but it's uh, acting like a fintech and, and operating at that speed, uh, connecting between these banks. So lots of interesting work going on. And um, Shubham at uh, BNY Mellon, I wonder if you could just identify some of the things you, know, you found really interesting because you guys, you know, have, have a certain presence in markets, but you have a pretty, pretty global reach. Um, are there any kind of schemes internationally you've seen that you thought were impressive and worked particularly well?
Ah, Shubham, that's for you. I think we've frozen temporarily. Um, Samia, back to you. Um, I just want to ask you about the uh, perhaps the more, more distant future. We, we tend to cover what we're doing there this year, next year. I, I was wondering whether there is such a thing as a five-year vision for cross-border payments, whether you've seen anything that is not the current, but the, the aspiration in the future. Difficult question. Anything spring to mind? Hard to say because uh, things are changing so fast in this industry. Uh, and I think, you know, five years ago, we uh, might not have uh, accurately forecasted where we, we would be today. Uh, and we're seeing a lot of great innovation happening in, uh, in different um, payment systems around the world, both sponsored by the central bank uh, and by the banking authorities, but also on the in the private sector as well uh, with some great fintechs. I think you mentioned, Charles, there are 5,000 fintechs now. Uh, something like that, and I believe that's the citizen. Oh, that's not that my I... number. It could be anything. I mean, what do you call a fintech? Is <laughs> you tell me. That's, that's, can, that's right. That's count. right. So I think we saw that statistic somewhere. Uh, who knows how that market will fall out in the next few years? It's it's going to be exciting. Uh, I think it's uh, you know, it's anybody's guess. Uh, but if I may quote our uh, our CEO at Visa, Ryan McInerney, uh, he says. The market is very competitive today and it's going to get more competitive, but we like our chances to continue to win. So <laughs> it's, a, it's a positive outlook there, but it's, uh, I think there's a lot of great innovation happening. It isn't. Visa has a pretty good track record of winning. So <laughs> wouldn't never bet against Visa. Um, uh, Ram, I'd like to ask you really, just as we close for some advice, because I know that there are some you know, very well resourced banks that have a grip on this. But of course, you know, the world is full of banks in emerging markets. And in the UK, we have all sorts of creative um, neo banks, kind of very specialist lenders, who um, re really struggle to keep up to date with cross border payments, or, or you know, to, to adopt the best systems, whether you've any formula or advice for them on how they should keep learning about international payments and whether any advice on you know, the avenues they should take for, for modernizing. So, yes, I mean, obviously, it's um, there is a lot of competition in there for between to acquire customers for cross border payments, especially retail payments. That's the area that we work in. Right. Um, and um, the only way that you can do it for banks, like you mentioned, are to partner with fintechs like us. Right. So and we talked about the complexity of aligning compliance requirements across different geographies, right? This is something that obviously we started facing when we started out and our system is built to handle that. So it abstracts away these complexities and we have a compliance team that is very well aware of what it takes to get a payment across border, what is required in the country of origin, what is required in the country of transit what's required in the destination countries, who needs to be, what transaction needs to be reported where, how exchange control regulations here, limits here, all of that stuff. So working with providers like us who abstract away these uh, complexities is a good start while they learn how to deal with their customers' requirements, their markets. And these, especially in retail payments, it's quite complex because each diaspora has its own unique way of sending money back home, its own unique needs, its own hmm. unique calendars, right? I mean, there are different times of the month in which people send money home. All of this varies across geographies and uh, corridors. And this is something that is very country specific. You, you mentioned the UK. The UK has so many migrants sending money back home to hmm. 100, 120 countries. We see all those, a lot of those transactions coming through us. And each one of those corridors is extremely different in its nature. And it's the kind of transactions that go through. Some countries, the average ticket size is $50. Other countries like India, the average ticket size is $2,500. Right? So there is a huge uh, variance in all of this. And it depends on the diaspora. It depends on their unique needs. And you can't access these customers by building a one-size-fits-all product. You have to go out there and customize it for them. 
Ram, to ask you a personal question. Does it feel like a moral mission? Because banking sometimes gets a you know, difficult rap in the media. But fundamentally, what you're doing is helping migrant workers send money back to their loved ones and their family without being fleeced by expensive transmission mechanisms. When they, what's the mood like at, at, at TerraPay? Do you frame it as a moral mission? We do. I mean, we don't, uh, we are not an NGO. We, we are a commercial organization. Mm. But we do think it is important. We, we do think you can definitely make money while continuing to serve people who are typically not served by traditional financial institutions. Uh, we know how to do this at scale. So this is this is something that we learned from, from the telecom industry. You, you can serve mm. people at scale with marginal cost increases by deploying technology efficiently, right? And that's a very different approach from what banks have traditionally taken. Banking systems are complex. To onboard a customer onto uh, to a retail customer onto a core banking system is expensive, mm. right? It doesn't cost us anywhere near uh, that much at all to do that, right? So for us, we can scale. I can scale to thousands of transactions as I can very easily on the fly because my systems are designed to do that. And therefore it doesn't cost me as much to serve that. Therefore I can pass on those costs to my customers. And we have examples of customers who have used us and who are really, I mean, I wouldn't, grateful for that service, for the immediacy of the service. Mm. Sometimes it's really important. I mean, we may, you know, for people like us, we may lose sight of the fact that for some customers sending $30, $40 home right then and there is the difference between feeding their family that week or not, right? It can be crucial. It can be the difference sure. between you know, getting medical treatment That's or it, not. Yeah. And, it's, and it's important not to fleece those customers. And yeah, we do take that very seriously. And we work with our partners to try to meet those customers' Mr. requirements. I, I couldn't agree more. Now, what, just before we finish, I know we have an elite, elite panel here. Um, Samia mentioned before we began that um, AI had a role to play somewhere in this story. Now, Samia, tell us, artificial intelligence and cross-border payments, I'm unsure of the connection. What is the connection? AI absolutely has a role to pay, play in uh, better routing of, of payments, um, fewer failures, um, better compliance checks. When and here's where banks and uh, you know larger financial institutions, uh, Visa included, have an advantage because they have the wealth of payment data and they can use that to more easily uh, find red flag payments, catch terrorist financing, or you know improve routing of payments based on um, everything that they've seen in the past. So I think that's that's part of the future story here for sure. So routing, of course, fraud. Fraud naturally is, yeah. 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 Tremendously influenced by AI. Okay, good answer. Yeah, thank you so much. But uh, Shubham, then before we leave, just tell us what's going on at BNY Mellon. I mean, yeah, AI can mean so many different things. What does it mean at BNY Mellon? Look, BNY Mellon is <laughs> investing heavily again into AI. We've got, you know, quite a few solutions. But as Somya mentioned, you know, fraud prevention. It's one of the biggest friction points in cross-border payments. So how can we leverage our wealth of data to, you know, have intelligent routing of transactions, maybe route across the, you know, the, the, the least path of resistance to screen transactions more effectively and, you know, catch, uh, you know, any kind of activity up front, but at the same time, minimize false positives. So our focus is to reduce the friction when it comes to cross-border payments and reduce delays with transactions getting stuck in sanctions as you know not just at bny mellon but across the network uh we want to work you know, we're working with our partners be it correspondent banks or tech providers to bridge that gap and that is our focus with uh, you know, how can we find that common ground that balances risk the trust of the customer but at the same time keep that open line of communication and ai has a very important role to play to achieving all three of those Gosh. Panel, thank you so much for your expertise. I must correct, I began this session thinking this is an intimidating subject. It was a complicated subject. It turns out I was kind of right to be cautious, but there are clearly grounds for optimism. The standardization, the emergence of new technologies, 
and above all, just the better customer service. This idea that migrant workers should ever be paying 6.5% for sending money overseas is a scandal, hopefully ending. So from myself, from Samia, from Shubham, and from Ram, thank you for watching. I hope we all learned something. I definitely did. And I will see you at the next edition of FinTech Talk. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye.